Hello friends. So I'm sort of experimenting where I'll need your help. Uh, it's an interactive case discussion uh, where every question which will be asked, you'll have to answer in comment section below. What is your thought process and what you would have done if this patient reaches to you at that point of time? So uh, looking forward to solve this case. Uh, my name is Dr. Khanjan Shah. I'm a consultant pediatric intensivist. Uh, currently, I'm practicing at Snake Children's Hospital at Ahmedabad. So well, let me start with a history of this child. Uh, you know, both history, this female uh, child normally delivered both full term 2.7 kg and she cried immediately after birth on 21st of March, 2020. You know, just at the time where lockdown was about to start in Rajkot. There were no antenatal uh, complications or any maternal uh, health issues were there antenatally and that was uneventful. Now on, sorry, so day four of life, this child starts getting vomiting and excessive sleepiness. So this was the first symptoms with child two on day four of life. Uh, just to complete the family history, it's a non-consanguineous union parents and previous female child died on 14 day of life. And the document showed she had a sepsis, a GI hemorrhage and DIC was the diagnosis. And now, so if this child, so first question for me is what all you would do at this point, if a day four old newborn comes to you with vomiting, excessive sleepiness and with family history where one kid has died. So I'll write you to your answers in comments below. So how do how will you proceed? Will you admit or not that you have to write? And uh, what investigations, if you uh, admit, then consider doing it. So yes, you would definitely admit this child. And the investigations which were done at referral point, I'll, I'll share those. But what are the possibilities which you would think at day four of life? So just write it down all, now pause it for a few minutes or a few seconds at least and write down what all possibilities you may think. It may be simple, you know, uh, uh, what I would say, gastrointestinal reflux, uh, two sepsis, or whatever comes in your mind, just write it down at this point. So uh, the child was admitted at Rajput and these were her investigations which were done. In CBC, hemoglobin was 21, WBC counts were 10,000 and platelets were 85,000. CRP was 3, INR 1.7, bilirubin total was 14 and direct was 2.1 on day 4 of life and SGPT was 44. On day 6 of life, uh, as you can see, uh, HB is 19.6 gram, WBC count 12,700, platelets 80,000, CRP is still same even after 2 days it has not uh, increased and INR is 2.5 now. A bilirubin is 9.2 and direct is 7.4. HBSAG was done, that was negative. Even of mother, it was negative. On day seven, hemoglobin stayed high, platelets but improved, a CRP more or less same, and INR started going up. Uh, so fibrinogen was done, which was 380, and gamma GT was 11, USG abdomen was done, which did not show any. A specific findings. So these are the reports. Now, now what all possibilities comes to your mind? So I would ask you to pause uh, your video and write in comments what are the possibilities can cross your mind at this point of time. Yeah. So, so his child was admitted IV fluids, IV antibiotics, partial exchange, and FFP was given at referral unit uh, till. Uh, this time. So now we received the patient on 28th of March, uh, where, you know, with the history, as we said, one child died, this child day four to day eight, having a vomiting, excessive sleepiness, jaundice, and coagulopathy in investigation and treatments, partial action, IV antibiotics were given. Coming to the examination at, at admission, 
there was deep ictus present a uh, respiratory wise shallow was normal for abdomen there is no hepatosplenomegaly stool color was yellow sugar was normal the vital cvs was normal child was irritable but no focal deficit so these were the examination finding of that child when we first received with that history and that investigation on 28th of march so now how would you proceed further what investigations would you add to this child and what change in treatment you would consider doing at this point please please write it down so you may be wrong uh, you know there is nothing like right or wrong uh, as the case unfolds as the time unfolds many a time we get to the diagnosis so uh, whatever the differentials we may have in our mind we start managing that so we admitted in nicu investigations we sent uh, a septic screen including blood culture uh, a complete lft rft uh, PTA, PD, triglyceride, torch, ammonia, and lactate was sent. Vitamin K, IV fluid, and IV antibiotics were started. And you know, counseling was a part because it was the COVID time. A lockdown had just started four or five days back, and parents had come from the Rajkot, so they were in little hurry to go back because things were turning uh, very difficult uh, at that point of time. So what next? What more we could have done? so at that point now what are your you know what once you have scratched your gray matter what all differentials comes to your mind i would like to just see what we had at that one of time the sepsis as common uh, the common thing common or torch infections would come iem like galactosemia would be presenting like that some factor deficiencies leading to coagulopathy congenital hls so so this is what we uh, our line of uh, thought of action uh, was there but you know uh, i'm sure you may also have some different differentials at this point so now we sent our investigations and our investigations were like this hemoglobin 20 counts 13000 platelets improved from 1 lakh 10 to 1 lakh 35000 crp was 5 blood culture was sent and which later on turned out to be negative in lft Uh, SGPT was 55. Billy was still high with direct, so there was a neural cholestasis. Gamma GT was normal. Alt was high. INR was more than eight. Now every day going, her liver functions were deteriorating very fast. Albumin was 2.9. Ammonia was 65. Torch diagnosis and it was sent. Uh, Torch titer was sent. RFT blood gas and lactate was done, which was normal. so these are the preliminary investigations at day of admissions so as we said crp of 8 sgpt creatinine normal albumin 2.9 so an alpha free radical protein was done so basically it's a uh, you know tumor marker or it's a non specific uh, tumor marker i would say which is elevated in any of the chronic liver diseases uh, even and uh, tyrosine certain iem like tyrosinemia it would come elevated it is an uh, non as i said non specific and it's an age dependent so during early infancy you may see high counts so to interpret this test you would need to go through the age as well as what all things uh, possible things could be there so now in on day 4 uh, like the information so far we have one sibling death on day 14 this child with coagulopathy a uh, query thrombocytopenia which was improving and conjugated hyperbilirubinemia so this was what the handles we had uh, to explore or to get into the diagnosis further so what next so now you know we are not going anywhere uh, two three days into the illness uh, hospitalization at amdavad and still you know, we're scratching our gray matter so you know my mentor used to say that if you don't get diagnosis this follow this five step first step is revise the history revise your examination uh, third step was put down all the possible differentials and read all of them and see where this child fits the most and for take help of all the sub specialties we had a gastro we so basically this child was already under doctor uh, vaibhavsha we had a gastro care and he was involved from the very day first so he, uh, uh, in the management so these were the four things which my mentor used to say that uh, do that and most of the time you uh, come to the diagnosis so uh, so this is so now once we are seeing uh, if we give importance to that one sibling death on day 14 
So what are the possible diseases that could run in families? So some genetic, uh, genetic disorders would uh, come first in the list, a uh, certain infections would lead uh, come uh, second in the list, which would run from like uh, uh, again and again in the same uh, mother, immune or malignancy and certain drugs. So we have to, you know, explore all these possible options and inquire again, take history again and uh, dig it deeper. So I use uh, up to date uh, and where, you know, causes, causes of neonatal cholestasis, there is a long list of uh, causes available where, uh, as you can see, obstruction, infections, inherited cholestatic disorders, carbohydrate metabolism, you know, so IEMs. Uh, allo immune toxic miscellaneous. So there is a long list uh, from where we'll have to find the cause. And one by one, we have to read each and see how this child is behaved. So anything else you would consider at this point? If you, if you have anything, you can write down that at this point, this is a possibility which you could have done. So we had certain differentials. So galactosemia was coming first. So there was not much hypoglycemia but jaundice, vomiting, hepatomegaly, failure to thrive, poor feeding, lethargy. So these are the presentations where how the galactosemia would uh, present and clinical conditions of the child started to deteriorate. So we thought and uh, GAL1 put enzyme levels were sent. Meanwhile, treatment investigations taught GAL TMS, GCMS was sent and uh, this was the uh, management which was going, FFP was given. Again, counseling was becoming more and more difficult uh, because of not getting to the diagnosis and conditions deteriorating. We all come across that every now and then. In the patients of parents relate, uh, parents and the relatives, uh, you know, it starts going down uh, once uh, uh, as the day passes. So Galvan put enzyme levels were done and that came out to be normal. Uh, uh, we had thought of congenital uh, HLH also. So ferritin was checked and ferritin came very high, came 7,286. So again, ferritin, uh, if you see the congenital HLH has this uh, diagnostic criteria uh, which are mentioned here, but uh, you know, one sip died uh, with uh, severe liver dysfunction and this child again, hyperferritinemia and uh, sepsis or uh, like presentation of thrombocytopenia. And so, uh, even though it's not meeting all the criteria, but one of the differential which we had thought, so we started exploring that as well. As we know, ferritin is an inflammatory marker. It can go high in uh, you know many conditions. It's not specific to anything, even chronic transfusions, following liver diseases. Uh, it would macrophage. So it will. Uh, it can go haywire in many of the situations, and not specific to the any particular condition. I'm, I'm sorry for my voice, Lil, I'm not well. Uh, so summary so far we had uh, with investigations and history, we have a child where C sepsis has been ruled out. CRP came negative three, four times and blood culture sterile twice. Uh, for galactosemia, it was normal. Torch titers were negative. AFN ferritin were elevated, both being non-specific. There was a liver failure. There was a coagulopathy. TMS, GCMS report came, which was normal. Bile acid levels were sent, that came normal. And on background of the history, we have one female child who died on day 14 with sepsis and hemorrhage. So how would you, now what do you think, what it could be, uh, where we are heading to? So we went across to, uh, back to that table, which we discussed, it didn't look like obstruction. So one by one, we started uh, ruling out the possibilities. Uh, there was no sepsis, UTI urine was checked and those things were not there. Uh, galactosemia, fructosemia, it was uh, was not there. So, you know, one by one, uh, there was no shock, half perfusion, intestinal obstruction, thyroids were checked, was normal. So, you know, we were ruling out one by one thing. The only thing which you could not rule out as of yet was gestational immune liver disease. So then we thought of now going behind, uh, like uh, to see for this condition. So we reviewed the literature. So we have a child with neonatal liver failure. There is an hyperferritinemia. There is a sibling death. Now we need to prove extra hepatic cirrhosis to uh, uh, match this puzzle of uh, what we say it as gestational alloyment liver disease. 
So we did an MRI of liver. A special softwares are there. So you have to speak to the radiologist that we're looking for this particular thing. And MRI of liver was done, which showed iron overload. Even buccal mucosa biopsy was done. And that also showed uh, the deposition of iron and was suggestive of hemochromatosis. So now we had evidence of, uh, you know, uh, he, uh, iron deposition also. So the diagnosis clinched was a neonatal hemo hemochromatosis or gestational alloimmune liver disease. So this was a diagnosis. I hope, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, how many of you had that in differentials, but if it is not there, it's just the approach which I wanted to discuss. It's a rare condition. Uh, but any child with neonatal liver failure, this should be one of the differential, uh, was the go goal of this case. So I'll, I'll put a link of this beautiful article uh, uh, in the description below. Just go through that. Uh, it's a good read. Hardly take five, 10 minutes. Description is down there on neonatal hemocratists. Uh, etiology, it's an autoimmune disease where IgG crosses from 12th week of gestation and it damages the liver. And many a times kids are born with cirrhosis or complete liver failure. So detail is that in there in that article. Uh, extra hepatic manifestations would be it, it iron gets deposited in myocardium, endocrine, endocrinal glands, gastric mucosa, renal tubules, respiratory tract, etc. Uh, usually we do a buccal biopsy and to you know prove that there is uh, iron overload. So clinical features would be child would be in IUGR, oligo, prematurity. It can present liver failure anywhere from 18 week of gestation to three months after the birth and can have a spectrum of liver disease right from simple hepatitis till liver, uh, fulminant liver failure or cirrhosis, hypoglycemia, coagulopathy and bleeding, jaundice, uh, edema, hypoalbuminemia will be there. So these were the differentials of this condition, galactosemia, tyrosinemia, fructosemia, infection, sepsis, HLH, and mitochondrial diseases also. So diagnosis, you need a high index of suspicions uh, to clinch this diagnosis. And you'll have a severe liver disease with extra hepatic cirrhosis, uh, either submucosal gland biopsy, and Prussian blue staining, or you will have T2 weighted images of liver in, uh, in MRI and that will help you clinch the diagnosis. But treatment is double volume exchange transfusion, IVIG, and supportive care. So, this child was uh, exchange was done. And uh, prevention so, basically, this is a congenital but not familial disease. It's not a genetic, and previously it was thought that it's a genetic condition and that's why it used to recur but that is not so. So uh, mother may have normal pregnancies, three, four normal childs, but if there is a first child, then there are 90% chance that is after that child, uh, that again, the childhood uh, recurrence of this disease would be there. And you know, you can prevent it by giving IVIG to mother 14 weeks onwards. So th that all is there in the description below, uh, in that article, which uh, description is there in the link. Link is there in the description, I'm sorry. So one can prevent that also. So coming back to this, our fighter, double volume exchange was done, IVIG is given, close follow-up is done. And now this child is uh, almost uh, two years uh, doing fine liver enzymes are being monitored closely and uh, she's doing absolutely normal now. So now that child who expired also could have had this disease itself, where the, you know, it mimicked as if sepsis uh, because there was a GI hemorrhage and uh, sepsis was the diagnosis of the first kid which expired. So basically take home message from this case is that sepsis is not the diagnosis all the time. Uh, we need to dig it deeper whenever a child comes mimicking as sepsis. So this is a congenital and familial but not hereditary uh, disease. And prevention, you know, once you there is an index case uh, for every next pregnancy, as the chances of recurrence are very high, uh, you have to team up with the obstetrician to treat this condition right from 12 to 14 weeks of gestation. So, you know, if you are thinking about rare diagnosis, then you are rarely correct. But that doesn't mean we don't have to think about the rare diagnosis. Uh, this is just a quote I made that up. Just uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, going through this video. 
I have recently published a book on our experience on making hospital in India. Our practical tips are there. If anyone is planning to make that, a link is there in Amazon. It's available, and that link is available on the description below. Just you can click there, and uh, you can have you'll have to download a free app called Kindle app, and from there you can read that book. App is free. Uh, then the book you can get it from there. Uh, thank you so much. This was just, as I said, an experiment I did on interesting cases to solve together and approach to more important is to uh, approach we discuss. Thank you so much for your time.